a wee lad, uh, one of our kind of family traditions, not that we had very many, but one of our family traditions was that on a Sunday, most Sundays, we'd go visit Granny. And Granny lived in Ballylanders. And uh, back in the day, 80s, 90s, the roads were... The roads aren't great in Limerick, but they were even worse back then. Uh, they were hurt, so then, like you know, you'd be bouncing around back at the car, like for the, about the 50 minutes between Thurles and Belly Landers, and going through Holy Cross and Holy Cross. It's all bends, it's all bends, it's all bends, and to Galway, and it's just bends, bends. It was, it was kind of a sickening journey as a child. And yes, I was one of those little fellows who was who were like screaming from the back, "Are we there yet? Are we there yet?" <laughs> okay, so we kind of get there somewhat queasy, and um, and then Granny would be there, and Granny, Granny, Granny was great. She passed away in 2006. Uh, and she always had the flat seven up, ready for you know any <laughs> any sickness that may occur. <laughs> the the bo- bottle was probably there since our last visit, like you know untouched. And uh, wrinkly apples, you know the, the Granny Smiths that were so old they had they had begun to wrinkle because they kind of looked like her actually, <laughs> the, the same kind of soft wrinkly texture. Um, and when Granny would talk, I never really understood her. Uh, it wasn't because of her Limerick accent, uh, but more uh, just she talk, she spoke of a an age, a time that I just didn't understand. You know, as a 10, 11, 12, 15 year old, she spoke about like things of yesteryear that just really, I just had no idea. Like, you know, people with different pains and surgeries and hips were played. I had no interest in that as, 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 as a child. Like, and I didn't know what happened meant, I suppose, either. So they'd be talking about these things. And uh, yeah, as a child then, as I said, I just, I didn't, I didn't know her. And maybe I didn't, I didn't know everything. That, I didn't know anything of what was in there. You know what I mean? All I saw was the external, right? Then I, when I hit about 14, 15, I started playing guitar, and then I started learning, um, well, you know, the essentials like for any kind of session, rebel songs, you know, uh, Komochi, Black and Tans, and that's, that sort of thing. And so um, then we went to visit Granny, and uh, Mam said. You know, do you want to play a song there for Granny? So anyway, I, I, I played something to do with the tans and fighting and drinking and all those kind of songs. And then Granny said, oh, yeah, I remember when the tans were around here. I said, you remember the tans? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? And she had story after story about the, you know, the, the tans and what they did and, and hiding people. And then that her, her am I allowed to say this? Her dad was a doctor. He used to uh, break into the, well, not, he's going to the, the prisons and break the prisoners out, right? Uh, he's f- find ways of pressing keys into candles and all this sort of stuff and, and get the prisoners out. Like. And uh, I discovered that my granny was fascinating, <laughs> right? That now the, the stories that she spoke about were just inc- not only incredibly interesting, they were like something out of a movie, right? It was unreal. She was born in 1912, so like, she would have seen an awful lot. Um, she got married quite late, and uh, it was an arranged marriage. And then I didn't understand this whole arranged marriage thing. But you see, when, when, with, when, you have, when you had large families, you couldn't break the farm up into you know, nine pieces for the nine kids, because you, 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 you don't have nine barns, you don't have nine horses, you don't have nine carts. There's only enough for one farm. So who gets it? Well, traditionally, the oldest brother. So what happens to the sisters? Well, they have to get married. They have to, they have to move on. You know what I mean? You have to, get them out of the house because they can't just be hanging around you know, when there's a new, uh, and now uh, the oldest brother and his wife and now his seven or eight kids. There isn't room, so arrange marriage, off you go. And that's how it happened, you know? So she got married to my, my granddad and so on. Okay, I digress. Um, the point being, I had met this lady for years and years and had no idea of the universe that was inside her the universe of experience and history and ups and downs and joys and sorrows and all of that. I just, I didn't know her at all. Okay. I didn't know her until I started asking her about her, until I started listening to her. And when it comes to our, our faith, there, there is so much of our faith that I think we don't understand. Certain things are mysteries, so again, the, the, the idea of a mystery is that we don't, we don't try to resolve it or solve it. Sometimes a mystery is just, you just contemplate it. You just kind of sit in, in, in the glory of this mystery. But there are other things that we can and should understand, like, like the liturgy, uh, like scripture. These are things that we can and should try and understand. We'll be looking into scripture today, uh, mass tomorrow. Uh, I was on a flight to Slovakia about seven years ago, I think, and I was sitting beside a, a, a girl, 
and we got talking and you know, I said, we, 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 she's, I could tell by her accent, she was German speaking, I said, are you from Austria? Because often Austrians fly into Bratislava and drive back to, to, to Austria, it's, it's very close. So uh, she said, yeah, I'm from Austria. And I said, great, well, what are you doing in Ireland? Are you working on holidays or what? And she said, yeah, I work in Ireland. I said, fantastic, what do you work at? She said, I'm involved in marketing. I said, ooh, very nice, very nice. And then this question came to mind, which I don't know where it came from. Well, I think it's... <laughs> It gave me this homily, so I, I, guess, it's, I guess it's the Holy Spirit. Um, I said, look, if, if you had to market the church, because that's kind of, it's kind of, in a way, what I have to do. Yeah, as, as a priest, like, we have to know what the church teaches, but then it's not just kind of knowing it. You have to, you have to kind of try and spread that. You try and win people back. You have to try and teach it. You know, that's part of our priestly ministry is teaching. Uh, so we, we have to teach what the church believes and teaches and, and, and win people back. You can't convince them, but you can try and win them back into what's available here. So if you had to market the church, what would you do? And she gave me an answer which I absolutely loved, and uh, it, it fascinated me for, for quite some time afterwards. She said, well, you just apply the standard principles of marketing that you do for anything else. And I said, right. And they would be what? <laughs> and she said, so of course, yes, of course, yes. Google quickly, standard marketing principles. Um, and she said, well, you see, every product has to have a USP, a unique selling point, a unique selling point. She said, look at the Volkswagen group, okay? Volkswagen, Volkswagen, the Volkswagen group is actually way bigger than you might imagine. They own Lamborghini, Audi, obviously Volkswagen, uh, Skoda, and Seat. There might be Bentley, I think, as well. There might be another one in there. But none of those cars really compete with each other. Obviously, Lamborghini, if you're a soccer player earning billions of euro, get yourself a Lamborghini. Crazy, absolutely useless cars. Uh, no boot at all. Um, or like, you know, if you're a business executive, you get yourself an Audi. Uh, if you want a good solid car now for pulling a trailer, Skoda, right? If you're kind of a young driver and you want something kind of sporty looking, say it. So the cars don't really, they have their own niche and that's important because otherwise you, your own products are competing against each other. So they have their own kind of area, good marketing, unique selling point. Get yourself a Ferrari because I'm loaded. Get yourself a Skoda, because you know, I want a good solid car that won't let me down when I'm pulling two pie balls in my, in my horse box. You know what I mean? So um, it's good marketing. What's the unique selling point of the church? And I went, oh, that's good. Like, that is a good question. That is a really, really good question. And what struck me wasn't just how good the question was, but how for decades, our, our, our Christian faith, our Catholic faith, has become such that we think it's actually wrong to ask that question. We think that it's better to say, look, everyone has their own way, and that's okay. Everyone has their own spirituality, and that's fine. But if, 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 if a married man, for example, we have a beautiful young married couple over here, right? Um, and if, if, if a husband were to say, you know what I mean, uh, this is my wife, you know, but I love all women, I love all women, it's important, you know what I mean? All, all women are wonderful. They, they, they are, they are. This, this just happens to be mine. You know what I mean? Would everyone say, well, f thank you for being so open-minded, that's just, that's beautiful. Or would you say, would you man up <laughs> and just say, this is my wife, I love her, and there could be beautiful people over here, I don't really care, it's my wife. That's, that's love, you see. That's, that's cute, right? That's nice, right? So you are allowed be, actually not only are you allowed be, you should be, confident about the person you love. Now, there are other great people out there, absolutely, but this is, this is my wife, and I love her, and I love her more than anybody else, and that's okay. Not only is it okay, it's the way it's supposed to be. So we have a faith that we are actually supposed to know, and we're supposed to love, and we're supposed to be confident that this is the truth. Okay, so our unique selling point. Jesus Christ is the image of the unseen God and the firstborn of all creation. For in him were created all things in heaven and on earth, everything visible and everything invisible, thrones, dominations, sovereignties, powers, all things created in him and for him. Before anything was created, he existed and he holds all things in unity. That's Jesus. 
Now, we don't, we don't get, get like kind of aggressive and say, that's Jesus and therefore it's not Buddha. But, but this is Jesus, you see. You see, Jesus is who he is. He's not who I make him up to be. Because we have this idea, and, and when you think about it logically, it's, it's, you can, there's a huge logical error in it. If God is who I make him up to be, well then, I just made God. And if I made God, that makes me a God maker. <laughs> God. And that's exactly the problem. We've kind of put ourselves in God's place. So now I'll, I'll make up God according to my image and likeness. So I, God, God will be as, as I want. So God doesn't have a problem with certain moral things because I don't have a problem with certain moral things. God wants us to be eco-warriors. That's easy. That's, that may, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have to change my life. You know, I just have to recycle a couple of cans and we're good to go. You know, eat recycled cardboard and then, you know, it's all good. Uh, so that's easy. So that's a God of my making, a God of my understanding. Now, don't get me wrong, I know the, the, the AA, AA does speak about, you know, um, relating to a, a God of your understanding. That's, that's, uh, that's taking people where they're at. Okay, so I'm not for a second slating that, that approach. You, know, you have to take people where they're at. Uh, okay, we won't get lost in that. Uh, but that's, that it's, it's okay to start somewhere. But as regards speaking about our faith, we are allowed to be and should be confident that this is the truth. Because we believe in one God. What is he? Father Almighty. He's the creator. We believe in Jesus, his son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. So we believe our faith and by the way, okay, quick definition. Let's not get lost. Faith. Faith isn't just belief. When I was a wee fella and my wee little teeth were falling out, belief in the tooth fairy was very profitable. Okay, I held on to that until I think I was about 16, 17, I'd say. <laughs> oh, ma'am, I, I was playing hurl and I lost a tooth. Oh, at least the tooth fairy's going to come. <laughs> you know, uh, it's... But it's made, just because you believe it doesn't make it true. You can believe things that don't exist. You can believe things that are false. You can believe ideologies that are harmful. Just because you believe something, just because lots of people believe it, doesn't make it true. Like all of, uh, all of the children who believe in... You know, ho, ho. <laughs> right? Um, okay. Uh, so, on, on all that kind of thing. Lots of people may believe in it. Doesn't make it real. Doesn't make it true. Okay? So, there's something beyond this. It's like, oh, it's called, oh, it's philosophically, it's called an objective reality. That something is what it is, whether I believe it or not. This is a pattern. Made from brass and gil slightly gilded. Needs a bit of work, but there you go. Okay, now people in Australia have never seen this. They don't know what exists. Does that have any effect whatsoever on this pattern's day? No, there are 80 million people, uh, China, okay, <laughs> India, 1.2 billion people. None of them know this exists. Apart from maybe the four or five who may have watched the live stream mass here. Apart from that, that 1.2 billion people don't know this exists. Does that, does that in any way affect this, this pattern's day? No, God is who he is. If we believe in him, does that make him more God? No. Nope. If we don't believe in him, does that make him less God? No. If everyone believed in the tooth fairy, would that make her exist? No. If no one believed in an existing tooth fairy, would that make her not exist? Or if she's a her? No. Okay. So belief in something doesn't make it real. We don't make God. God is who he is whether we believe in him or not. But the, the key to, to understanding our faith is that God reveals himself. He wants us to know him. So like me and, and, and my granny, she, she was there all the time, but I, I, did, I didn't know her. I'd, I'd met her all, hundreds of times. But I didn't know her at all until I kind of sat down, kind of sitting at the Lord's feet, if you will. I sat down at her feet and marveled at her stories of the tens. And we sit at, at, at the Lord's feet and, and marvel at the stories of his creation and humanity's fall 
and the Lord's redemption in order to get us to heaven. Marvel at these stories, but I didn't make any of them up, and they don't depend on my opinion. This is God revealing himself. So faith, faith isn't just belief, whatever we kind of believe, because that'll change. And it's also then, it requires me to do all the work. And sure, my, my brain is limited. My time here on earth is limited. My understanding is limited. It's very risky to allow us to kind of make it all up for ourselves. What if we get it wrong? So faith is already as such, it's prepared for us. So what is faith? Faith is defined in the catechism as the assent of the intellect and the will to God's self-revelation. So my intellect, so that's my, my understanding, and then my will, how I choose. I, I can know something is wrong and still do it. I know smoking is wrong, and I still smoke 20 fags a day. It's going to kill me, but I just can't stop. So I know intellect. I know it's wrong. Will, I still choose it. So knowing something and choosing it are very different things. So faith is the ascent, so the lifting up, the raising up, of my intellect and my will to what? To how God reveals himself. You know, it's, none of that has to do with how I make up God to be. Because then there'd be, how many of us? A legal number of people in the chapel, and we'd have that legal number of people of different understandings of, of God. That, but then who is God? <laughs> who, who is he? How, how, how is he? Because maybe we just made him up. And that's the, the, the big difficulty when you're dealing with atheists. Like, if we have this approach to spirituality where everyone makes it up for themselves, a smart person is going to look at this and say, well, hang on, if you believe God is X and you believe God is Y and your ideas are different, well, you can't both be right. Either one of you is right or both of you are wrong, logically. You know what I mean? If you, you cannot both be right at the same time. You can't be. So God is what he is, whether I know it, whether I believe it, whether I care, or whether I don't. God is what he is. And in order that we might know how he is, who he is, what he is, he reveals himself. Sacred scripture, sacred tradition. That's how it works. That's our faith. None of it's made up by us. None of it. So it's up, up to us to try and understand who God is, but not make him up, not, in, not fill in the, the blanks, because you could be wrong. And if you get the idea of God wrong, you could turn him into a monster. And that has actually happened in the past where even in our own culture, where God was demanding, but in the, in the, in the negative sense, he was maybe somewhat cruel. Uh, he was punishing. He was hard. There was no compassion. It was just like a rule book. And when you find yourself before him, get the, there's my intention for the day, you get, you get the big rule book open, you did this wrong, you did that wrong, you did that wrong, hell. That's still many, many people's understanding of God, but that's not what's revealed in Scripture. That's not what's, what's taught to us in the Catechism. That's not God. But it's people's understanding of God, unfortunately. Then there's the, the kind of pendulum effect. We swung from that in the 50s to the other side now in the 80s, 90s, to the God who allows you to do whatever you want, and it's all okay, it doesn't matter, we're all going to heaven. And if we're all going to heaven, then it doesn't, none of this matters. Prayer doesn't matter. Sacraments don't matter. Conversion doesn't matter. The Eucharist doesn't matter because we're all going to heaven. Well, then why try? If everyone gets a free medal, that medal is worth nothing. You know, if you've got a, if you've got a good participation medal, right? You get a, a medal for participation. That one goes in the bottom of the drawer. You don't really care. Whereas the county championship where you have to turn up for training in the thick of winter, in the thick of spring, in the misery, in the mire, and the misfortune, and the briars, and the brambles, and cutting your way through the thistles to find the, the slitter, right? You know what I mean? That medal that you win, genie, that's going up, on the, that's going up on the, over the mantelpiece. Bye! Right? Because that won't cost you something. You appreciate it because it costs you something. The free medal, you couldn't care less. So, thank you. Uh, so, God is who he is whether I know it or not. So it's my job to try and understand him as he is. And there's, there's great confidence in that. So what's the unique selling point of, of, of our faith? Jesus speaks to us. Jesus as God reveals God. Reveals who God is. So I can be confident in that. It's not, it's not made up by man. 
It's not made up by any people or group of philosophers or, or, or spiritual gurus or spiritually enlightened people. None of our faith is made up by them. God reveals himself. That's pretty amazing. And it's also unique to Christianity. We, we, we could go into the, the specifics of why not just Christianity but Catholicism, but we haven't time, so only one homily. Uh, but uh, as a starting point, Christianity, you see, is God's self-revelation. Another slight little error is to think that Christianity began with Jesus Christ. That makes our faith 2,000 years old. But no, our, our faith goes the whole way back to our, our Jewish, but the Old Testament. That, that's all our faith, too. You know, that, that's all preparation for Jesus. Then Jesus comes, and the process continues to the church that we have today. But it doesn't begin with Jesus. You know, all, you'll see as, as we look at, at the Mass now tomorrow, and obviously sacred scripture today, uh, all of the Old Testament, that's all, that's all our history too. That's you know, like, you think of the Easter liturgy, all the Old Testament readings and Moses and the Passover and the crossing of the Red Sea, that's all our history. That's, that's our faith too. So our faith goes the whole way back to when God started revealing himself to people. Back with Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 12 tribes, and so on. So we can be confident that our faith is not made up nor does it open, depend on human opinion at all. And the Pope can't change any of this because this is what God says about himself. So we ask the Lord today to open our hearts to his self-revelation. And as we come to know him, then we will see his infinite love, his compassion, his mercy, his tenderness, his gentleness, his patience with us. And the more we, we see his love for us, the more we'll be able to respond with our love for him. When we see him as a loving father, when we see Jesus as our redeemer, savior, and brother, when we see the Holy Spirit as the love that unites us all. Amen.